Well, good morning, Saints. I pray you are well. It's here at Calvary South Cheyenne. It is really cold this morning. So wherever you are, I hope you are staying warm. If you are socially distancing, which you probably are if you're picking this up, or maybe you're catching it later in the week by the internet, uh, man, I just pray everything is okay for you guys. We love you. We love the Lord. And it's a privilege to serve him with you. That being in mind this morning, I'd like to take a moment and just say that this teaching this morning will be a little bit shorter online because uh, that's the way it's going to be at the fellowship because we're going to take time and have communion. So you might want to time, find some elements, some juice and some bread, and then celebrate uh, both the body and the, the blood of the Lord Jesus, the new covenant that is celebrated at communion. And we celebrate that not only in his offering, but in his resurrection, his ascension, and his return one day. So through the week here at Calvary, we have several ways that you can worship the Lord. We have prayer on Sunday nights with Ann Murray, and we do that both in person and with Zoom. We have a Wednesday night or a Wednesday morning study with the ladies and uh that lady study currently right now is in the book of Ruth, and that's at 1030 on Wednesday mornings, and uh, we can get you that address. Uh, go to our website, calvarysouth.org, and just scroll down, and you'll see a phone number, and we'll get you the information you need. Also, we have a Wednesday night study called Holy Smokes with Gabe Pena. Uh, the last weekend, I think they just spent a week, they spent time in prayer, but they're studying through a book by Hendrix. And I understand it's a very good one. And they spend some time together in fellowship. Also, that same evening at 6.30, Gabe's is at 6, and that's all on Facebook Messenger. At 6.30 on Zoom or in person, depending on the, the week, we're studying through the book of Genesis with, uh, with uh, Doug Wilson. And a great study. We've really enjoyed it. On Friday evenings, there's a lady study in the book of Ruth. I think that's at 6 o'clock. And Ann Murray can get that information to you. It's for Zoom. On Saturday mornings, we have a men's study that is both Zoom and in person at 1217 South Greeley Highway, south, south of town, or as you're going out of town. And uh, we're behind the building and down in the basement. We start at 7 o'clock in the morning, and currently we're in the book of Mark. So with that in mind, I want to go right to the uh, Lord with prayer, and then we're going to jump into Acts, the 13th chapter. Lord, we thank you for the day and the opportunity to spend some time together, Lord. As the day uh, moves on and as the temperatures warm up a little bit, I just pray that you keep people safe. Lord, if there are those who are physically ill, maybe catching this message on the Internet, I pray, Father, that you'd minister to their bodies, Lord, that you'd heal them. There may be those that are struggling spiritually or emotionally, Father. We just pray your hand over them. Lord, your word says that you, uh, we can come to you and take it, take from you, Lord, and learn from you, and uh, that we'll find rest. So that's what we're here for. We're here to seek that out even right now, Lord. So we pray you'd walk with us now in the knowledge of your word. Be with these, your saints, and with me, your servant, in Jesus' name, and the saints of God said, amen. So last week in the 12th chapter, we saw the first martyr of the church of of the apostles, James, and uh, such a such a grievous thing. We saw Stephen martyr earlier, so I shouldn't say the first martyr of the church, but of the apostles, the brother of John was the first that was taken. He was taken by Herod, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he incarcerated Peter, put Peter in jail, and after the Passover was going to put him to death also. And we saw Peter asleep between two guards on the night before that was to take place. And uh, then he's uh, aroused by an angel, not the angel, but an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord, who uh, touches him. The chains fall off. Uh, he girds his, his uh, sandal and puts on his robes and, and goes out through a gate that opens automatically into the city. He ends up at Mary's house where they're having a prayer time for him and probably churches all over the city house churches are praying but it's that building that he's familiar with 
And then the saints that are there are the saints that he's familiar with. And so he goes there and, and, uh, and he testifies of how Jesus had uh, set him free. And uh, then says, tell James, this would be James, the brother of Jesus, who was kind of leading the church in Jerusalem at that time, says, tell him what has happened. And then Peter goes on his way. It's kind of the last we see of Peter until we see him in the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, where he stands in testimony whenever the uh, report is brought in about uh, the Gentiles. And uh, we'll get to that when the time comes. But it's during that time that after Peter's escape, Herod uh, scrutinizes the guards, examines them, and then puts them to death, which shows us what uh, Peter's uh, sentence was, because the guards would have assumed Peter's sentence. Now, the thing that's interesting to me in that, and I just want to spend a moment on it, we'll move out, but um, these men were chained between one of them, or uh, a man chained between these two is probably one of the most powerful evangelists of that time. As a matter of fact, when Peter preaches initially, uh, 3,000 come to Christ, and then it's thousands after thousands, and now he's chained between two guys in a, in a cell. Uh, I cannot help but what I believe that these men would have known of the Lord Jesus. But after they're examined, they're put to death. And uh, there's a sticker out there, and I've seen it on the internet again recently, that says, don't be caught dead without Jesus. And I don't know if these guys received Christ, but I sure hope they did. I sure hope that, uh, pardon me, before they were taken and, and put to death by Herod, I hope that they turned their hearts towards the Lord, for they certainly had the good witness. But then uh, we see Saul and Barnabas and John Mark, who was probably at Mary's house whenever Peter was released. These guys go back up to Antioch, uh, they'd come down from Antioch with a ministry to the saints of Jerusalem. So now they're going back up. And so between the time when Herod dies, which is about 44 AD, and the time whenever they're going to go out now from Antioch uh, is about two years. So they've come up from Jerusalem. They're ministering there at Antioch. And this is the group that's ministering. So let's just open here with the 13th chapter in the first verse. Now in the church, Ecclesia, the, the called out ones, the commonwealth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ecclesia, the commonwealth of Israel now has been uh, part, the, the heritage of Israel in the Messiah now is being celebrated by a Jew and Gentile that believe. That was at Antioch. Antioch there about 300 miles north of Jerusalem, the third largest city in the Roman Empire at that time, about a half a million people. Uh, there were certain prophets and teachers. So in this uh, place where the persecution of the church may not have been as extreme as it might have in other places, um, these guys were, were there and maybe from house to house like they were at Jerusalem. We don't know. It doesn't say. But the first one to, mit, to be mentioned is first prophets, somebody who spoke forth the glory of God and of the promises that were coming. And then teachers were those who would, uh, and, and also prophets were given the gift of exhortation, but teachers were given the common knowledge of what it was to follow after God with the Old Testament and then revealing the will of God through the epistles later in the New Testament. So these guys, many of these guys are going to be involved with, with uh, the writings to the New Testament church. But Barnabas there, the son of consolation, uh, Boy, we've seen him first in the fourth chapter, and then we've seen him all the way through the book of Acts to this point. And he's always there mending fences, building bridges. That was his MO here in Antioch. He'd served faithfully. He'd gone to get Saul up in Tarsus, brought him back down. They'd gone to Jerusalem. Now they're back up there doing this ministry. And then Simeon, who was called Niger in the uh, uh, New Living Translation, it's Simeon, the black man. Now, I don't see any prejudice in that at all. There's neither bond or free, neither male or female, uh, neither Jew nor Gentile. All are one in Christ Jesus. And that's exactly what I see here, is that he simply called that because that's what he was. And Lu uh, Lucius of Cyrene. Now, this Simeon, or Simon, however you want to say it, uh, 
Remember that there was a man that carried the cross, and some scholars, expositors, believe that this Simeon was, in fact, the one who carried the cross. And he had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Now, later in Paul's writings, we find out that uh, uh, Paul talks about uh, the mother of Alexander and Rufus, who is like a mother to him also. So uh, this family had, had turned wholeheartedly to the Lord if this was, in fact, this Simeon. Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So this Menaeus is an interesting fellow. He's brought up basically in, in a royal household, probably very affluent, uh, that he was brought up alongside of, of Herod means that they may have had the same uh, nursemaid. Uh, they have, may have been fed by the same woman and, and one commentator spoke about that, and it was pretty frank and honestly a little embarrassing, but uh, these guys were like brothers. And yet here we see Menaean stepping out into the faith, of course, stepping away from the heritage that he would have had in the household of Herod. And then Saul, our dear Saul, who uh, we first seen uh, holding the garments of those who had stoned Stephen, in chapter 7 and then breathing out threatenings against the church and eventually arrested by the Holy Spirit on the road to Damascus. This is that Saul. And we're going to see that Saul, his name, moving over to Paul today. So as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, um, in the ESV, it says as they worshiped the Lord. And I think worship and ministering to the Lord go hand in hand. I don't want to say one translation is better than another, but I would like to say this. You should not, because some people say, well, I'm ministering for the Lord. Saints, before we can minister for the Lord, we must worship and, and uh, minister to the Lord. Get our hearts back to the center, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's so important. It says they ministered to the Lord and fasted. They were putting off the things of the flesh to put on the things of the spirit. Many times, and Paul in his writing says, I buffet my body daily. And what he was saying there was he bit, literally would, would subject his body, to, um, bring it under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and in this place, as it says, and they fasted, uh, I think about today in many churches and and understand that there's an anemia in the church in America today, and it's because we don't spend enough time buffeting our body. We spend more time buffeting our body. And uh, we might have a church potluck, and, and it would be a spiritual gathering, and I, I use that term loosely, because truthfully, maybe sometimes it would be better if we just got together and abstained from food and prayed. Now, the Holy Spirit said, and so it was at this time when there were, we see this group and the church, not just these guys, but the church, they're, they're, they're ministering to the Lord, they're worshiping the Lord, they're fasting, they're putting aside the things of the flesh to put on the things of the Spirit, and the Spirit says, now separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Now, how the Spirit, Holy Spirit did that, I'm not sure. He can speak through pastors, the Holy Spirit can speak through the Word, the Holy Spirit can speak through the prophets. As a matter of fact, later in the book of Timothy, we see that uh, by the laying on of hands of the prophets, Timothy was called to ministry. So could be very much something like that. Verse 3 says, Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So they laid hands on them and they were sent. Now, <laughs> this is a play on words, guys. But they were sent. It wasn't that they went. They went because they were sent. Sometimes we have people that get emotional and they cash everything in and they take off in a ministry and then for whatever reason that ministry doesn't come to fruition the way they think it should and it's because they went before they were sent. Saints, I'm not saying don't go. But if you go, make sure that it's the Lord leading. There's an old saying where God guides, God provides. 
And I think that's so very true. You know, the ministry we serve in here at Calvary South is a very small ministry. And uh, quite honestly, I did not anticipate being where I am today. Uh, I'm an old man, but this is where we are for this time. And the Lord is providing for us. So um, I think that that's, that's a good indicator. Let's look at verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And this being sent out again, then they were faithful. When they were sent out, they, they, they felt the move of the Lord. They were encouraged by the body. They were supported by the body. And so they're going out. Now they go to Seleucia. And in Seleucia, it's about uh, 13, 15 miles down the Orontes River towards the Mediterranean. So it's a seaport. Remember that uh, Antioch was not. It was a commerce center, and it was a center of a lot of other bad things, but it was not a, a place that you would ship from. So they go down there, and uh, probably there's a body down there. We don't know, but there may have been a church down there that was started and kind of um, fell out of, um, how do I want to say this? They came out of Antioch, Syria, uh, kind of as a, overflow down into there. So I think that maybe while uh, these guys are down there ministering, uh, they were adding to the church, and then and then from there they sailed to Cyprus. You know, I can almost see this ministry, and I'm sure you probably can too. It kind of tickles me just a little bit that the Lord would allow them this freedom to say, let's go back to where you come from, Bar Barnabas. You know, Paul being able to say, Barnabas, where do you think we should? And Barnabas going, you know, not far out there is the land that I come from. And it's it's a tremendously hedonistic area. And there's a lot of sorcery. There's a lot of stuff that goes on out there. There's a lot of debauchery. They worship Venus out there. And so uh, the Bible says, where sin doth abound, grace doth the much more abound. And I can just see... Barnabas, now this son of consolation, going, I'd really like to go out there. Uh, I, be, I believe we're led of the Lord. And so they sail from Seleucia to Cyprus. And they're in this island area out there in, in the Mediterranean, and they go around that island. There's, there's uh, some distances around that island. So it says, and when they arrive in Selimaeus, this is a port on Cyprus, they preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. This was the common place for them to go. They would have, remember, Barnabas and Saul, very Jewish. Their ministry will be to the Gentiles, but they're going to start in the Jews. Whenever they get to a certain area, they're falling in with these Jews. And then from there, they'll be preaching to the, to the God-fearing men. And so pre, Paul would preach, or Barnabas would preach, and, then it, and the, the God-fearers many times would be standing outside of the synagogue looking in or listening in. And so we can see that uh, just a beautiful thing as they preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, I spoke about this earlier in today's study, and we spoke about it last week, but this is John Mark. Sometimes it's good for us to sort out these different individuals. We had James, the brother of John, who was martyred. We had James, the brother of Jesus, who had become a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. We have John the Baptist. We have John the Apostle, who is the brother of James. And then we have uh, John Mark, John being his pre Hebrew name, uh, Yohanan, and, and Mark probably his Greek name. And so uh, that's the way this kind of goes, but it helps us to identify who they are. And so he's a young man here. It is interesting to me how we see this individual come up at different times. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, we see a young man at the arrest of Jesus who escapes in his linen tunic. Literally, they grab him, and he slips out of whatever they grabbed, and he's gone. This is only mentioned in one Gospel, and many scholars believe that it was John Mark that this young, was this young man. So when you see this stuff and how it fits together, it's just so beautiful. And the Lord is so good. Let's look at verse 6. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. So they'd gone through the island and gone over the island. It's a pretty good-sized island. They end up in another place called Paphos. Now, 
once the, well, like I said already, this this area, Cyprus, was given to idolatry. It was given to sorcery. It was given to debauchery and uh, the, the, the worship of Venus. And uh, women were, were uh, how do I want to, women were bound to serve in the temple of Venus. And it was not a pleasant thing. So it was at this place. And so they got to pay for us. They found a certain sorcerer a false prophet. Now, um, interesting to me that these, these false prophets uh, were told in the Old Testament that there would be false prophets that would rise up and, and, uh, and lead people astray. Uh, we've seen this earlier with Simon, who uh, had practiced sorcery, and we saw Peter calling him out. And at that place, Peter... Uh, calls him out, and 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 Simon says, "Pray that what you've said will not happen." Um, I don't know that Simon was saved, but I would like to think that he was. I don't see that at all here in this passage. A false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, or the son of Jesus. Remember that Bar in the Hebrew is son of. For instance, uh, Barnabas. Uh, is the son of consolation and remember his name was Joseph but they named him that here we see this fellow that takes on Bar Jesus the son of Jesus but he wasn't anything like Jesus he was a false prophet and the Lord speaking in the gospel said that after his departure false prophets would arise well here's here's a, a perfect example who was with the proconsul. The proconsul was a person of uh, sub, uh, civilian leadership with military authority appointed by Rome. They, they had a military contingent that they had control over, but they had civil authority. That's the way I understand it. Now, he was an intelligent man, an intelligent man. This is not, how do I want to I said that already. We do not want to think that our faith would cause us to check our minds at the door. True faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is an intelligent faith. And intelligent people that study out the Word of God don't just go off of what somebody else says, but they build their faith line by line, precept by precept, can set forth an intelligent faith. Peter, in his writings, and I've used this with you guys before, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, uh, be ready to give to any man that asks an answer. That would be an intelligent answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So in the book of Proverbs, we have the king speaking wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, the folly of those who do not follow the king's wisdom. And there's so much more to that, but this is an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, Barnabas, the son of consolation, and Saul. Saul is a Roman citizen. He is a Hebrew among Hebrews. He tells us later in his own writings, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, Concerning the law, blameless. He was astute. Gamaliel had said of Saul that he was the most ravenous student that he'd ever had, Gamaliel being a leading uh, teacher uh, of the Jewish faith, uh, a rabbi. And so this was his assessment of Saul. So here's two men that are very well versed in the Old Testament, now standing before uh, Paul, uh, Sergius Paulus, and uh, he's ready to hear the word. What a great opportunity. This is the hand of God. You see, this sorcerer was seeking to lead the proconsul away from the faith, the Sergius Paulus. And isn't that the way Satan works? He's always trying to deny the things of God, to lead people astray. And that's what it is. You see, there's a straight path onto the Lord, but there's 
confusion woven in by all of this false religion and misrepresented teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. This guy says he's a son of Jesus, and he's not. Jesus himself says you'll know them by, your, by their fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth bad tree, fruit, and a bad tree cannot bring, bring forth good fruit. Now, flip those two around, but you see what I'm saying. Look at verse 8. But Elimaeus, the sorcerer, or so his name is translated. So his name was Elimaeus, but it translates the sorcerer. What a name. Withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So he's arguing the faith with them. And I, I just love the way this looks. Look at verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul. This is where we see this first. And so Saul, his Hebrew name, Paul, his Roman name. Saul means ask for. Paul means small. Paul says, God came to save sinners of whom I am chief. The closer he got to God, the, how do I want to say it? He, he, he didn't boast. He said, if I'm going to boast at all, I'm going to boast in Jesus. Even in his thorn in the flesh, he learned that the Lord was sufficient. As a matter of fact, the Lord told him that. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Who is called Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and looked intently at him and said, so here is a man completely filled with the Holy Spirit now allowing the Holy Spirit to move through him to completely uh, decimate this ministry of Satan. And that's exactly what it is. You know, so many times today we seek to do battle with Satan without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Saints fall back from that. That's why we see that it's so important that we worship the Lord and then we're sent out by the Lord. We minister to the Lord and then we minister for the Lord. And so, here in this place, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he looks intently. That means that he's gotten down into this situation and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud. Calls him out for exactly what he is. Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. And this person who was a Jew, who had departed from being part of the chosen nation, the nation of one God, now is... is involved himself in the worship of false gods. And he himself is deceived, and he says that you're full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil. He says he called himself the son of Jesus, but Paul now says, you're not a son of Jesus, you're a son of Satan. There's a motorcycle group out there today that they boast that, the sons of Satan. That breaks my heart. I pray that that group, there's people in that group, that realize what it is they're saying and turn from their wicked ways. Repent and turn on to the Lord of Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. If there's a son of Satan who picks this up and you are turned to the Lord, I want to talk to you. Here in this case, he says, you're a son of the devil. You're an enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? The way to the Lord, he says, is straight path. But you've perverted it. You've twisted it up. You've tried to make it into something that it's not. It's false religion. Saints, there are people out there today who are professing Christ with one word and perverting the gospel with another. And the Jesus that they preach is not the Jesus of the Bible. And I'm going to say some hard words here, but to me, in my heart of hearts, they're sons of Satan. They're deceived and become deceivers. We've got the Word in front of us. We've got the Holy Spirit to lead us. We've got good, solid biblical teaching in many churches around the land, and yet they've chosen to walk in darkness. Not only that, but they choose. These bar Jesus has come along, and they, they lead people astray. They lead them after wealth. They lead them after health. They lead them after all these uh, doctrines that what profiteth a man if he gained the whole world but loses his own soul, Jesus said. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. 
there's a settlement. There's a day of reckoning. And for Bar-Jesus, Elimaeus, that's that day. And this is what we're seeing here. This is the testimony. And the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. Now, how long he was blind, we don't know. We also don't know whether he repented. In the 8th chapter, whenever we see uh, Peter call uh, si Simon out, he says, pray this doesn't happen to me. But we don't see that here. He says, you're not going to see the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. This was not only a testimony to Elimaeus, this sorcerer, that he was in error, but it was a testimony of the authenticity of the Jesus whom Paul preached, who Barnabas preached. The hand of the Lord was in this situation. In the Gospels, there was a man brought before Jesus who was blind, and they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And that was the teaching of the day. And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents. But this was done so that you may know there was a testimony that was to be born that day, and he healed that man so that he could see. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what had been done, being astonished, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Notice he wasn't astonished at Barnabas' teaching. He wasn't astonished at Saul's teaching. He was astonished at the accurate witness of Paul and Barnabas of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was, And so this teaching of the Lord, what went on there? I don't know. We see it in one little short verse. But I honestly believe what probably happened was now they had the door open for them to show uh, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, the ways of God more fully, the ways of the Lord more fully. And so how long they remained there, we don't know. But we know that after time, we'll pick up next week, it says, now when Paul and his party set sail. It wasn't like, get, get this man saved and get out of here. Like other places in Scripture, I think that when this man turned his heart to God, it was a work for that entire community. Here's a man who is a leader of the community who has turned his heart to the teachings of the Lord. And I just see Paul and Barnabas not wham, bam, thank you, we're out of here, but spending time rightly dividing the word of truth and teaching Sergius Paulus an intelligent faith. He's an intelligent man. He wants intelligent answers. I got to wrap this up, but let me ask you today. We've had men in our history who have spent their lives giving us an accurate demonstration of both the power and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty through his word. We can be like those fellows that were chained to Peter, and we can, you know, we might even assent. You know, this guy really believed. But we don't make Jesus our own. And so my question today is, will we die in our sins? Or can we claim the name of Jesus? And when we do claim the name of Jesus, are we learning to worship the Lord? Are we serving the Lord? Are we ministering to the Lord before we minister for the Lord? And whenever we come into a situation where we face opposition, are we willing to stand in the full authority of the Holy Spirit like we see Barnabas and Saul do here today. Saints, this is exactly what the Lord wants us to do. So in these 12 verses, we see the birth, the first missionary trip, if you would, of Paul the Apostle. As I said earlier, uh, Herod died in 44 AD, we know that. These guys probably were back up in Antioch until about 46 when they leave on their first missionary journey. This is what's going on here. This is a wonderful time. Between 46 and 49 AD, they're out on their first missionary trip, 
and you guys are getting to be part of it. Let's pray that the Lord continues to move as he did then and that there are many added on to the church because of your faith, because you may be the one to whom they are chained for witness. In our marriages, where we work on our jobs, in our sphere of influence with the teams we play with on sports, where we go to school. Let's be used by God today. Let's not miss this opportunity. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity again to be together in your word. Thank you for the witness of these two mighty men of God. And this young man who has come alongside of them, John Mark. Lord, I pray that we would be those who would stay the course and stand in faithful witness when people like this Bar Jesus, this Elimaeus, come at us. Let us remember that it's not a personal attack on us, but it's an attack on you. And so, Lord, we pray that your strength would prevail and that we could stand with fortitude in the witness of the one who saved us. Let us worship you now in communion and in song. In Jesus' name and the saints of God said, Amen. God bless you. Take a moment, celebrate communion. I'll see you next time.